have to have hearts that are thinking of the generations to come. And I, I thought about this. I've never had a door open when I was stingy. Generosity opens it. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. We're in a giving series. I talked about uh, giving. We started it last week and I shared a message in a way that I never did before on giving where I basically broke it down on how it works in a church. And we talked about all the different areas in our, our giving, how it works, where does the money go? And it, it, it is just as basic as it could get. And I want to encourage you, if you missed last Sunday, go listen. The reason I share that is I, I believe that sometimes people are resistant to it because they just don't understand how it works. And so I wanted to share uh, last week really how simple it is. But I know at times people get uncomfortable when you talk about money. Uh, one of the things people say all the time is don't go to church because all they want is your money. And uh, we talked about that too last week, so you can hear that. But I know it gets hard for some people and it gets uncomfortable. And, you know, last week I was putting something in the oven to bake something in the oven and I burned myself. I don't know if you can see that on my hand right here. You guys see that? Say, oh, give me a oh, poor, poor baby. Um, I burned myself in the oven. It was hot. And uh, when, when I burned myself, though, can I tell you what I didn't say? I didn't burn myself in the oven and go, ah, I'm never using the oven again. I didn't say that. Um, how many of you ever got food poisoning? Yeah, a bunch of you. I've been food poisoned a couple of times at restaurants, you know, at the end of it, when I, when I got better, I never said, I'm never going to a restaurant again. I still go to restaurants. It's happened. It could happen again. I've just learned I need, I need to be more careful. Uh, I think for a lot of people, the reason why finances is hard, because maybe you've been burned in church. But unfortunately for some, they just basically come away with the attitude is, I'm never going to church again. Here's a popular one. They're all hypocrites. They're all hypocrites. Don't go to church. And, and we kind of get that attitude, and, and, and I get it. It's, it's, it's hard, and things happen, and you're going to get hurt in church. I'll, I'll tell you that. You stick around here long enough, your feelings will get hurt at some point. You say, why is that? Because you're human, and I'm human, and everyone else around you is human, and it's what humans do. We, we, we step on toes sometimes, and uh, people aren't perfect. Thank God we serve a God who is, and who we strive to, but... At times, you've got burnt, you got hurt. Uh, people say, oh, I don't want to serve anymore. The last church I was. And I think the bigger question is, all right, I'm sorry you got hurt two years ago. Why do you still smell like smoke? <laughs> I think too many of us, we're, we're, we, we smell like smoke for too long. Come on, get washed in, in the blood of Jesus Christ. I've been hurt in church. We, we got to get cleansed. We got to move on. But the same thing in church. We get resistant at times because we've been hurt. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't quit going to church. Don't quit serving. Don't quit giving. Don't quit loving. Don't f quit forgiving people. It's huge that we keep doing that. I want to let you know that giving as a whole, do you know that giving doesn't please God? The Bible doesn't say that without giving, it's impossible to please God. Let me tell you what pleases God is it's faith. Faith is what pleases God. Giving is just one of the avenues that we can activate our faith in. In the same way, so is loving. Sometimes you got to love by faith. Sometimes you got to forgive by faith. And those are all parts of faith. Now, Isaiah 32, 8 says, generous people plan to do what is generous and they stand firm in their generosity. I love that verse uh, generous people. That's what I entitled the message today, generous people. How many of you want to be a generous person? All right, we've got a couple. To be a generous per people that stand firm in their generosity. Let me ask you this question. Would you rather hang around generous people or would you rather hang around non-generous people? Generous, right? Doesn't it get tiring to be around non-generous people? When you're done eating and you know you already got the check the last three times you got together and you're waiting for them to take it, that awkward moment when the waiter doesn't know who to give it to and you're like, <laughs> 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 
Isn't it better when you're almost like fighting over who's going to pay for the bill because you're both generous? To be around people like, hey, you got it last time, I'm going to get it this time. Uh, I think generosity, it's great to be around people who are generous. So I was just thinking about generosity, generous people. And I want to share with you these five things about generosity. Number one is this, generosity opens doors and gains favor. It opens doors and gains favor. We're in a construction project with our building. One of our engineers, we needed some work done. We were at a standstill for about two months. No response, no, no emails coming back, no, no phone calls coming back. We're like, oh my gosh, we need to get stuff done. Well, I found out what that guy likes. And I went and I bought what he likes and we had it delivered to him. We had emails the next day. A friend of mine building a home We needed one of the other contractors to come out and do some work, and they're really busy. Phone call, phone call, phone call, about two to three months, nothing, nothing. Project at a standstill, needed him to come out. Well, he drops off a case of frozen shrimp at his warehouse. He's at the house the next day getting that thing wired. Come on, generosity opens doors. I'm flying back last year from from Scotland, For whatever reason, I missed my connecting flight in New Jersey because my flight was delayed. So I'm standing in line to talk to the United representative in New Jersey and the person in front of me, you know what, this is is the people that all they do is take complaints all day long, right? They gotta deal with the problems, not the normal agent. This is just complaints. The person in front of me is getting that lady mad. And I'm listening and I'm like, I I can't say what I was thinking, but I was getting mad at that person because I'm thinking to myself, you're getting her all grumpy and now I got to go to her. And I'm watching the rep. She's angry. She's not even, you know, when they're on the computer and not even looking up. And she's like answering with her eyebrows. The head is moving. The neck is moving. And I'm like, oh, attitude is brewing right now. And I'm walking into this lion's den. And so this person, I can hear it. I'm like, oh, this guy is is off their rocker, getting her mad. They don't get what they want. They're upset. Finally, she says, go to the side. Somebody else will help you. Next. And it's me. I get up there, tell her my situation. I got to spend the night. I can't get to why she, she tells me we're not going to cover your hotel room the way your ticket is. We're not going to cover. I'm thinking that's not right. You're supposed to cover my ticket that you guys were delayed. I'm thinking this in my head because I'm passive aggressive and I'm getting mad and I'm getting upset, but I'm like, all right, Evan, what are you going to do? You know, she's telling me all these things and you know, in my backpack, I still had a box of chocolate macadamia nut candy. I bought, before I went to Scotland, I bought like the six pack and I took it with me and I thought, I'm just going to bless people in various places that I go, whatever. And I saved one for the way home and I knew who needed this one. (laughs) So this lady, she's like, you know, and I'm saying, and and I I reach down and I, I grab it. It's in my backpack. And I said, hey, I had one more box of this chocolate macadamia nuts from Hawaii And I put it on there. I go, I just want to give that to you. Oh, her face lit up. Long story short, I got my hotel room. (laughs) She printed out my bag tags already so I don't have to stand in line the next morning. She walked, my bags were in the, she walked over. Everyone else is waiting. She tags my bags for me. She's talking to me. She's smiling. She's laughing. She's walking me out. I tell you what generosity opens doors and some of you maybe there's some doors you need open I just say be generous walk into that office with a box of donuts take some mochi or pick up a sushi roll or something and and just bless somebody and you'll see that it'll open doors and you'll gain favor I'm telling you it works it works And I think within the kingdom of God today, some of you, you need doors open. You got to release generosity. And I I thought about this. I've never had a door open when I was stingy. Generosity opens it. Proverbs 22, 9. He or she who has a generous eye will be blessed. You want to be blessed? 
be generous. That's what the Bible says. When you have a generous eye, you'll be blessed. And I've seen it work. I've seen it work. It's almost as if our generosity will compel God to move on our behalf. Number two is this. Generosity is a double blessing. It's a double blessing. It's blessed uh, not just to receive, but you're blessed to give. Last week, fall, uh, or this week, fall break, I had my, last week, I had my niece for one day, uh, you know, little Nahe, some of you might know her, if you work in the children's ministry, you would know her, because she's a, she's a bundle of energy, and, and I, I took her out uh, of the house for a little bit, took her to Target, um, where, you know, whatever, doing our thing there, and we're checking out, they sell Pizza Hut pizza by the checkout, so I, I buy a pizza, we go into the Starbucks area where the tables are. We sit down, you know, and open up the pizza, which she tells me I'm not going to get any of the pizza because she's going to eat it all. And, um, you know, it's bigger than her face, but she's going to eat it all and, and not give me anything. And so, you know, here, here she is eating. And I didn't really pay attention much when we walked in, but I'm sitting there. And, and you know when you're just there and you know somebody comes up to you, right? And, and this person... I said, oh, somebody's here. I turn around, and there's a, there's a gentleman standing there. And this gentleman, I, I don't know if he was homeless, but if I had to guess, he was probably homeless. He was homeless. He, he didn't smell the best. Um, he was kind of disheveled and just, you know, kind of whoa. And my first thought was, he's going to ask me for money, right? That's just what, it, just what I thought. He's going to ask me for money. And, and he comes up and I look at him and I go, hi, <laughs> you know, and he goes, hey, I wanted to see if she wants some bubbles. And I look in his hand and he has a pack about this big with, you know, the long bubbles that you can blow and, and it's, it's sealed in plastic and he's, he's opening it and they're all different colors. And, and so I'm like, oh, okay. So I turn to Nahe and I go, Nahe, do you want some bubbles? And here's, again, rambunctious Nahe, who you usually can't shut up because she has a billion questions. Nahe, you want bubbles? No, thank you. <laughs> She's a little freaked out. <laughs> no, thank you. Eating her pizza. And so I look back at him. I go, oh, I don't, I don't think she wants it, you know. And he goes, oh, well, just what color do you think that she'd want? So I go back, Nahe, what color do you want? No, thank you. <laughs> she does it again, right? I'm like, oh, I feel so bad for this guy. And I was going to turn back to him and just go, oh, you know, thank you so much. But she just doesn't want it. I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, you better, you better take those bubbles. You know, it's an interest in life, especially in the generosity, that there are moments when we feel that no one can, or people perhaps in the, those circumstances have nothing to offer us, but we have everything to offer them. Right here, let me give you some money. Let me give you this or that. And I felt the Lord saying, everyone has something to offer. And you need to take those bubbles. So I looked back at him. I said, take the pink one. He lights up, gives me the pink one. I give it to her. I thank him for what he did. He sits down. I'm thinking about it. And I realized it meant more to him to give me the bubbles than it meant for me to take the bubbles. And I thought of that verse that says in Proverbs eleven twenty five, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. I could have robbed that gentleman of the opportunity to be refreshed. Just by saying, no, that's okay, keep it, keep it. It was actually my first impulse, if, if I'll be honest with you. Just keep it. But we took it. When we left, I seen him again. I thanked him again. I said, thank you so much. It's so kind, so kind of you. And he just lit up, smiled, didn't say anything. He had something to give. You know, if you want to be refreshed, refresh somebody. Open doors in your life. So we challenge people in that area. But number four is this. Generosity is a ministry. Second Corinthians 9.1, Paul Talking to the Corinthian church, he said, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. They're receiving an offering to give to the church in Jerusalem. He called it a ministry of giving. When you get involved in your giving, you're, you're part of the ministry. 
You're part of what's happening in Arise. You might say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not serving in any ministry. I hope everyone here is involved in the giving ministry, being involved in being generos, gener, generosity, generosity. And number five, here's the last one. Uh, generosity creates legacies. It creates legacies. Uh, we have to have hearts that are thinking of the generations to come. That's so important. In 2 Kings chapter 20, there's a, there's a story, and it's about King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, uh, when you read in the Bible, especially at that time, it's like, you know, the Chronicles, good king, bad king, bad king, bad king, good king, bad, 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 good, bad, good, good, bad. I mean, mostly all bad. They did evil, evil things, you know, sacrifice to idols, sex. I mean, just, just horrible things that were happening. Hezekiah would have been considered one of the good kings. He's one of the good, one of the good guys, all right? Um, Hezekiah got sick. He was going to die. He prays. God heals him, adds years to his life. It's a miracle. So God, God works. You see that in, in his life, there was a moment when the envoy came, the Babylonians came, and he takes him through the palace, and he shows the envoy everything that he has. shows him all the treasures in the temple, the gold, all of these things, you could almost say he was, he was prideful showing these things to them. The prophet comes to him and says, what, what, what did you do? What did you show him? Because I showed him everything. And the Bible goes on to say that because you did that, because you showed them this, because you were prideful in what you did, they're going to come back someday. Not in your lifetime, but they're going to come back and they're going to take your sons, they're going to take your grandsons, they're going to take the people, they're going to take all the wealth, and they're going to take them captive to another land. They're going to they're gonna take them away. Now, would you say, if somebody told you that, give your prophetic word, is that good news or bad news? Some of you are like, you don't know my kids. All right, come on, guys. Is it good news or bad news? All right. We need some family counseling here. <sighs> Taking my kids away. Hmm. <sighs> okay. All right, I was hoping for a very enthusiastic bad news. <laughs> At least you did it on the second time. All right. He said, okay, it's bad news. I regress. Where was I? Bad news. They're going to take your kids away. They're going to take them to captivity. Bad news. You know what Hezekiah said? He said, the word the Lord's given me is good. Why would that be good? They're going to take your kids they're going to take your people. They're going to, it's good news. And this is why he said it was good news. He said it was good because it's not going to happen in my lifetime. I'm not going to have to deal with it. They're going to have to deal with my mistake. But it's good news because I'm going to be okay till I die. I'll be comfortable till I die. And although Hezekiah was a good king, he was horrible when it came to leaving a legacy. He was horrible when it came to the generations that were going to follow him. And my hope today would be for all of us here at Arise Church that we wouldn't just think, why, why do we need to do more? Why should we give? Why should we sow? Why should we put our faith out there? Some of you think, I'm really old. I don't got much more time left. Why, what's the difference if we get into the new building? Or, uh, because there are generations that are coming after us. And I would hate for us to live in such a way that we just think, well, I'm okay. I'm comfortable. Who cares about the generations to come? No, we have to be generational in our thinking. You know that generosity will leave a legacy. It'll leave a legacy. And what we have, uh, just this little, tiny, cute little flyer here today. This is our Kingdom Builders Legacy Offering. We've got a picture. You can kind of tell it's a picture of our building on here. It's our Legacy Building um, Faith Promise Card. And it's really simple. Let me, let me explain this to you. There's two spaces on here, and all it is, is this is my faith promise. So our kingdom builders, we talked about it last week. You say, what's this offering for? It, we do it once a year, and it goes to different projects we do it. So it's not going to pay for electric bills or those. It goes to different projects. Right now, the project is getting the church building done. 
We got, the loan gets us close to the finish line. Our cash offering will get us over the finish line uh, to, to get the project done. And that's what this offering is going towards this year. And on the first space, you can write the amount. On the second space, write the same amount. You're going to tear off the bottom one, throw that in the offering box, throw it in there, and keep the top one, put on your fridge, put on your mirror. It's a reminder of what your faith promises to the Lord in your giving. Um, somebody's asked, like, well, what, it, where, don't I put my name on it? No, don't put your name on it. I don't want to know. It's a faith promise, not to Evan. It's a faith promise to God. I mean, what am I going to do in six months where I send you a letter saying, hey, your promise to God wasn't promised to God. I'm not going to do that. This is between you and God, all right? All this does is going to just give us an amount to say that, you know, either this month or over the next 12 months, hey, this is what people have, have pledged that they're going to give. And we'll be able to put it together and say, hey, this is, what, this is where we've been able to come to as a church. Here's a number that we're believing for. That, that's all that's for. But this is between you and the Lord. Um, you say, how do I come up with the amount? And it's really simple. Ask God what you should do and obey. That's it. Just ask God. It's that simple. Um, my uh, wife and I, we've, we've come to the number. I, I prayed about it uh, last week. I was driving in the car. As I was driving in the car, I felt the number drop in my spirit. And I had to say, yes, this is it. Um, I actually put the number in this morning and figured that out. And I realized against my salary above and beyond already, I already give above and beyond the 10%, but I realize that this kingdom builders over the, over the next year, I pledging to the give to that 46% is what the, is what I, when I put it in 46% above. So it's probably taking me closer to 60% over the next 12 months is the amount that we're going to sow into getting that building done. And the reason I share that with you is, is just to say we're in it just like everyone else. We're in it like everyone else. Now, you don't, don't, you don't have to do 60. You just ask God, what is it? Just obey. I'm just being obedient. And I want to lead the way in our giving. Now, um, can I ask this too is... Don't leave these behind. Take it. A lot of work was put into it because they couldn't find the perforator that makes you let that tear right there. So last night, Melody and, and Nathaniel and Naomi and Wyatt, they literally were in our living room with a needle poking every single one. Every single one of these holes are hand poked. I'm not making it up. Because I came home, I'm like, what are these guys doing? And they poked every single one. Um, and I don't know, maybe they poked their finger too. So blood, sweat, and tears went into this. But <laughs> they did that. So you leave this behind, it's kind of disrespectful to them. Take it home at least. <laughs> Take it home. And we are going to, may, maybe out of this offering, we're going to get a perforator out of the budget for next year, all right? But um, they did that, every single one. So thank you guys for doing that. But just ask God what to do and do it. <laughs> ask God. It's, it's that simple. And I'll close with this story. I shared this yesterday. So thankful for our Finish Strong ministry that honored uh, the pastors yesterday at the lunch. I, sh I shared this with them. Um, you know, my dad, he, of course, pastor Sure Foundation. He gave his life to Jesus. It was 1979, March of 1979, that he gave his life to Jesus. My parents, both of them, did not grow up in Christian homes. And really, when you hear their story, it's probably not the most romantic way. I don't, maybe it is. I don't know the way they met, how you view it. They were surf bums. My mom was hitchhiking to the North Shore. My dad picked her up. That's how they met. Um... Then she got pregnant with me. And then they got married. They didn't have Jesus in their life. Uh, my dad still partying with his boys, smoking weed, 
drinking, surfing, working. Uh, that, was, that was just his life, throwing dice <laughs> in the weekends. I mean, that, that was his life, and my, my mom was sick of it. I can remember around the age of three not understanding why my mom was living with her parents and my dad was living with his parents and I'd, I'd go in between and I just remember feeling sad when we would leave, right? And they're not coming and it's just sad. And um, 1979, March 1979, again, I was about three, my sister was two. My dad had an encounter with God in my grandparents' home, living room. And it was then that he gave his life to Jesus. My mom was there, she was in the bedroom. He walks to the bedroom and he's crying, he's crying, he's Patty. I gave my life to Jesus, you know, I'm gonna be different. It's gonna be different. My mom sitting there looks up at him and this is literally what she did. She goes, <laughs> I mean, when you're sick and tired, you're just sick and tired. You heard all, you saw the tears before, you heard the stories before, you heard how you're going to change before, and nothing changes. She was sick and tired. That Sunday, my dad, I remember he, he took me, went to church that Sunday. My mom didn't come. Right around the corner from where he grew up in Palisades, there was a little church, it's still there today, Palisades Community Chapel. Seats maybe about oh, I made 60, 60 to 80 people that could sit in there. It's not very big at all. And that's where my dad went on the first Sunday. He showed up to church. You know, he had a t-shirt. He had surf shorts. He had his rubber slippers on. Long hair to his shoulders, dyed bleach blonde from the sun. And he showed up, the little kids. And he showed up to church. And they loved him. They welcomed him. He went back the next week, the next week. Well, a couple of weeks into it, my mom ended up going to church because I think she realized, all right, maybe, maybe he's serious about this. She came to church. She ends up giving her life to the Lord. Uh, they start getting discipled in that church under Pastor IU. And my dad gets involved. He just, I mean, he just starts doing everything. They had cassette tapes back then. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, and that's okay. But my dad would go in after work, and he started making copies of the messages. Uh, he would serve in the kids ministry he even he said he even got stuck in the nursery how one one service he went in with with my little sister so my mom could sit in church and he's in there with the baby and another a mom another mom walks by oh here it gives my dad their baby and another mom can gives him a baby another mom all of a sudden he's in there with like four or five babies they didn't like background check back then you know they just they just hand their kids over he, he was in there with all the kids and, you know, he just, he, he just served. He, he just did. And he was really discipled uh, in that church. And um, a couple of years ago, we actually went there and I preached during the legacy. I don't know. Some of you remember that. I, we showed it on the video screen. I preached the message from that church. And that was the first time that I had been back there since I was a little kid. And I went there with different eyes this time walking in. And the church was basically the same, just older it was older. In fact, that, that legacy offering, I remember mentioning, I don't know if you guys remember that, because the, ch the church was in dire need of a new roof. It was leaking, that, that church. And we, we gave from that legacy offering $4,000 towards their roof replacement um, because I just thought, man, that's part of our legacy. We're, we're here today because of that. And so we, we sold into that. Um, I went with different eyes. And I, I looked at that church and I began to think a little differently because that church was probably, it was started in the 50s, May 50s, 60s, around that time. The building was built, I think, in the 60s. And I was just thinking of all the older people that came and gone before we even stepped into that place. The people that sacrificed and gave before we ever stepped into that place. And because there were men and women who gave selflessly and generously to build that church, there was a place that my mom and dad were able to go to. There was a place where their marriage was able to be saved, that our family was able to save. It put our family on the right path. From there, my dad moved here. 1987 started 
Sure Foundation in Pune, 2004. We this is an outreach from that church. We started this church in 2004. Uh, those churches are there because of what those people did and the impact it made. And here we are today. We're in this room because of people we don't even know who sacrificed and made an impact on our family that we were able to plant this church and now we're able to partner together. And here we are and we're on the cusp of finishing the next project today. And that building is going to be done. And you know, that ties all the way back to those people that have gone to be with the Lord and their investment that they made is still paying dividends to this day, spiritual dividends to this day because they gave. And when I think about legacy, uh, I'm giving us all the opportunity. I want to give all of you the opportunity to sow and give in our Kingdom Builders Legacy Offering. In, the, in this project that we're doing, because this is something that's going to live beyond, if the Lord tarries, live beyond our life. Some of you here, it's going to live beyond you. And that's a wonderful thing. And I just wonder how many other families like the Carmichaels are going to walk through those doors, whose marriages are on the rocks and families that are on the, on the brink of falling apart but because you gave and because you sold and because you, you said, I want to be generous in seeing this done, they're going to find a place of healing when they walk in. Because I'm telling you, there are going to be marriages restored in that place. There are going to be families that are saved, just like our family was saved. And imagine what else could be birthed out of that into the next season when it comes to legacy. To know, think, I just think about those in heaven. I'm, when I see them, I'm going to thank them for what they did. But because of their generosity, there is still residual blessing that's happened. That's what legacy is all about. Generosity creates the legacy. And if you're part of our church, um, this is your home. I, I, I always think this offering would be so great if it's in all play. Everybody's in on it to do something. If you've never done something, if it's like I've never done anything, I'll, I'll put $5. Just, just get some skin in the game. And I'll tell you why. When that building's done, I don't want you to walk in thinking, wow, it's amazing what they did. I want you to walk in thinking, it's amazing what we did. What we did. Because it's not my church, it's our church. And I want you to have ownership in what God is doing there. I want you to have dividends that pay in the future, in eternity. I want you to have people walk up to you in heaven and say, thank you, I'm here because you gave. I want you to experience that. And that's why we challenge people to sow and give.